in this video that's um, going to cover about 50 slides, we'll touch on chapter 6, which is pretty short, and then chapter 7, which isn't terribly long either, but it's a little bit complex because we're going to start discussing cellular respiration. So here's our specific plan. We are going to look at energy and metabolism, so energy systems, thermodynamics, why we care about thermodynamics, and then we'll discuss ATP, enzymes, and metabolism. Uh, in chapter 7, we'll look at how cells harness energy specifically, so some intracellular reactions, and then cellular respiration, a fermentation, and how we think these processes might have come about. So energy and metabolism. Um, energy is continuously flowing through living systems. The study of energy is called thermodynamics. There are a lot of different types of energy that you can choose to study, but I'm just going to point out three, or three, I'm sorry, two. <laughs> um, there's kinetic energy, so that's the energy of motion, and then there's potential energy, which is stored energy or energy of position. So when we were little, um, most of us probably, you might have learned about, you have a ball sitting at the top of a hill and it has potential stored energy and then as it's rolling down the hill it's losing its potential energy um, to kinetic energy that's causing it to move and it's that kind of concept and we'll we'll run into those things as we study energy flow in living systems um, your slides have had a bright sun on them because the sun provides roughly uh, 13 to the 23rd um, tons sorry that should say tons of calories per year so uh that's massive <laughs> so everything of course comes from the sun when we talk about um calories and work in living systems in biology we work in kilocalories which is technically 1000 energy calories and people always want to equate that to food what we actually put on our food is one food calorie one food calorie is 1,000 energy calories. And what an energy calorie is, is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's a little bit hard to kind of um, set all this stuff up in our mind. So breaking one mole of car carbon hydrogen bonds takes 98.8 .8 kilocalories. And if you need a refresher on mole, that's six point two zero times ten to the twenty third or six hundred and two million million billion ch bonds take ninety eight point eight kilocalories to break up so we're dealing in tiny tiny minute quantities um, when we're discussing all these things but it adds up creates the energy in a person when we look at um, reactions in cells usually we're talking about oxidation reduction reactions we're going to abbreviate reactions rxns or just rxn uh, throughout the rest of this so when you see that abbreviation please note it just means reactions reactions store energy um, and can be used to create new bonds that will store even more energy what we're talking about in the storing and movement of energy is actually physical electrons passing from one item to another. That's energy moving. So when we talk about oxidation reduction atoms, the thing that's being oxidized is what the electron is moving from. And uh, what's being reduced is what is gaining the electron. I realize that sounds weird. If you're reduced, you're gaining an electron. But it's a it's a reference to reduction in charge. So here's this image is, um, over here we have this, um, here we go, over here we have A and we see that A is following this little pathway and it is going to lose an electron and it's going to be donated to this new power. And then over here we have B and B is going to gain an electron. So it's going to be reduced. To look at it chemically, what we're looking at is a reduction essentially in res in desire for electrons, so we add electrons. So we, we're not sure what this atom is over here, but it doesn't really matter. We see in our first orbital we have one, two electrons, and then in our second orbital we only have one, two, three, four, five, five, six, which means that there's an opening up here for two electrons to be added. 
So it is going to desire two electrons. So when we give it those two electrons, we're reducing that desire and therefore we're reducing the atom. Um, we're going to look at all of these things in reference to our laws of thermodynamics. So when we talk about thermodynamics, we have to think about a few things. One, the amount of energy in the universe is constant. And all living systems have to do something to acquire the energy that they need. So we acquire energy from our universe, from the sun. We're capable of capturing that energy and using it to do physical work. Um, but some of it's always going to be lost as heat. And that concept of some of it always being lost as heat, that's our second law. And our second law is the fact that we turn potential energy into heat. None of our systems um, are perfect, and we call this, con this concept entropy. Our cars, for instance, your car is only about 25% efficient. Uh, and that's just typical for the system. And we know that because cars heat up when they use their energy. And that's the rest of the energy escaping in the form of heat. We can predict how chemical reactions are going to happen in our systems, and we do that by looking at something called um, the free energy in the system. And we can work all this out mathematically. We're just going to look at the theory behind the math. So as we go to predict, predict um, reactions, what we're always concerned about is the change in free energy. And how we calculate that is we look at the amount of energy that's stored in the bonds. So that's our first, um, our first unit. And then we subtract from the amount of energy stored in the bonds. We subtract the absolute temperature multiplied by a constant that measures entropy in the system. So let's look at that one more time. So we start over here with the amount of energy stored in the bonds in that system. From that energy, you, re you um, subtract the absolute temperature times entropy. <clears throat> and what we end up looking at is this G over here. And you're going to notice that they all have these little triangles. What this triangle is, is it's delta. And it means the change in. So the change in H, the delta of H, or delta H minus T times delta S, is the change in stored energy minus T times the change in entropy, because the entropy is going to increase. And that's going to tell us how the free energy in that situation has changed. Sounds a little bit strange. However, we can look at these situations um, and it will tell us how our reactions are going to occur. Because if you're releasing free energy, if your delta G is a positive number, then that's a reaction that's going to release energy into the system. If your delta G is negative, that's a reaction that's taking in and harboring energy. And we can see the difference between the two, between two potential reactions. Um, as a difference in their delta G. So that's the space right here. That's the difference in their free energy. In this case, the reactions, sorry, it's kind of scribbly, the reactions that we're looking at, our black line is showing you the reaction without an enzyme. And I threw this slide in here. It stands out a little bit from what we've just been discussing. But what you can see is that it's that free energy change that's minimized by the addition of an enzyme. So by studying free energy and studying the changes in free energy, we can take a closer look at how and why reactions are happening within our cells. <clears throat> so here this is again. The activation energy is the energy needed to destabilize a current reaction. So we have bonds, and they're already made, and we need to break them up somehow, and we call that the activation energy. We lower that activation energy by using catalysts or enzymes, and they're actually going to affect the transition site. And the transition site is just a reference to the orientation of whatever molecule it is that you're trying to get to react. So, oops, sorry. So as we look at transition sites, a particular chemical might be shaped in a very peculiar way. And maybe you have to get to the middle of it to make it react. Well, catalyst is capable of bending that chemical and physically kind of poking out that middle section so you can get at it. 
So that's how enzymes lower activation energy. They cause a physical change to make bonding easier to get about. Um, a lot of these physical changes in our cells, um, a lot of different reactions in our cells are all coming from adenosine triphosphate. It's the energy cur currency in the cell. This is what our adenosine triphosphate looks like over here on the right. Um, you'll notice that it looks pretty well similar actually to DNA um, or RNA I guess specifically. We say that because we have a 5 pentose sugar and it has an oxygen on the bottom so it has a ribo sugar. It has an adenine group. Adenine, of course, is an amino acid or a nucleotide. I'm sorry. Adenine is a nucleotide that we have learned about. And then up top, we have an ANP core. So we have um, one phosphate group. And when you add the phosphate group to your ribo sugar and then your adenine, we call that our AMP core. When you add another phosphate group, that's when the name of this whole big molecule becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate, two phosphates. And when we have this last group added, we call it ATP. It's adenosine triphosphate. So it has those three phosphate groups. What is important to note in these is that these phosphate groups are very highly negative. And that's really important. Because these three bonds are very highly negative, they're not terribly interested in reacting with one another. But they do because of those oxygens are so greedy. And it's because these are so, um, so strongly repelled from one another that they end up making a really great high energy bond. So again, phosphate groups are strongly negative, so that bond is unstable. The hydrolysis of ATP has a negative delta G. So the hydrolysis of ATP has a negative delta G, so it's taking in energy. It's mixing ADP with PI, and PI just means inorganic phosphate, a phosphate that's not attached to a cyclic carbon. So this process can drive endergonic reactions and we're going to learn all about endergonic reactions and we'll learn about two of them probably a little bit more than you wanted to know. So enzymes. Coming back to enzymes. We've learned about them in previous classes and I talked about them a little bit before. So enzymes have really nice 3D structures and their structure is built kind of on this concept of building a very close encounter between the substrate and the enzyme itself. It's going to move that substrate into the correct orientation. The enzyme structure itself isn't changed by the reaction. Um, it can change shape as a result of the reaction, but once that initial reaction is over, the enzyme is going to uh, revert back to its original structure. So those enzymes can't be used up, but there are time restrictions. We've studied reactions and we've always said that an increase in catalyst will increase the reaction. Well that's because one enzyme can only work on one molecule at a time. So if you have one enzyme for a hundred molecules, a reaction's not going to take place very quickly. But if you have a hundred enzymes for a hundred molecules, it's going to go nice and fast. There are some non-covalent bond interactions that are occurring within that space. So you don't have to worry again about those changes in enzyme structure because you're not, uh, you're not bonding with anything. You're just looking at like charges. So enzymes follow our concept of lock and key model with induced fit. What that means is that there is a specific ac uh, active site that has a specific substrate that it will work work with and they fit just like a lock and key but to ensure that you have the best fit possible you see what uh, you have on the right where you have an enzy enzyme substrate complex that will change just a little bit to induce the uh, the best fit available <clears throat> so we've learned um, that pressure or protein structure is not flexible, but rather it's rigid. But of course, at one point in time, that was simply a hypothesis. So how we studied this was that antibody antigen, antibody antigen binding can involve um, a change in protein structure. So a way to write this as an appropriate scientific prediction is 
if antibody antigen binding can involve a change in protein structure, then we will see a different crystallization of the protein structure when an antibody antigen complex is bound. Sounds a little convoluted, but we'll take a look. So um, the test was to determine the structure of a particular piece of antibody. Uh, they took two different chunks of antibodies that matched one another. One of them was bound and one of them was unbound. And they compared the two. I want you to stop and think for a second. Um, why do you think that was done? And what do you think happened? Kind of say it out loud to yourself. Yes, it's an awkward pause, but I expect you to be thinking. All right, so what they found was that the antibody folds around the antigen with induced fit. The reason they did it with no antigen and a bound antigen was just a, uh, it was a control group. The no antigen was a control group, and the bound antigen was looking for a change. So this experiment reminds us that uh, proteins are flexible and that we need to remember our control groups in our experiments, because if they got what the antigen, bound antigen looked like, but didn't have anything to compare it to, their experiment was essentially kind of useless. Enzymes are neat because they can occur in numerous forms. Sometimes they're all alone, but sometimes they can occur in these multi-enzyme complexes. Um, there are a whole bunch of enzymes that stick together really closely. We do this in systems where the rates are limited by collisions, so maybe there's not very many enzymes or there's not very many substrates and they have a hard time finding each other these enzymes and substrates will come together that way. In case you get the process started, you don't have to worry about losing that molecule somewhere in your system before it can manage to find enzyme number two. It decreases side reactions. So maybe enzyme number one acts on its substrate and now its substrate is very highly susceptible to change. If you can pass it immediately on to the next enzyme complex, you don't have to worry about that. So you're reducing side reactions. And then there's unit control. So you just make sure that uh, enzyme one gets it and then enzyme two gets it and then enzyme three gets it and it's all in one nice system that's perfectly controlled. Um, this enzyme that you see over here to the right is 2-oxoacid dehydrogenase. Uh, it's a multi-enzyme complex found in humans and we are going to read a paper on that one in a few weeks once we have um, solidified our understanding of reactions and we've gotten into our genetics. There are some non-protein enzymes, which is kind of crazy, just saying. Uh, we've actually found that RNA is capable of catalyzing itself, which is really cool. There is some substrate specificity with these riboenzymes too, which is the name we've given to these RNA enzymes. So they're really particular. Some of them are intramolecular, which means inside the molecule. They work on themselves. And then some of them are intermolecular, so they'll work on whole systems, which means a ribozyme can either make the RNA itself do its job better, or it can make a huge RNA complex bound with other proteins, make it do its job better. So that's really cool, and this is another paper that we are going to read. So here's your job with this paper. You're gonna read it, you're gonna read it and analyze it. You'll highlight it, draw on it, take notes on it, and then when you come to class next period, um, you are going to take a quiz on that paper. But you'll be able to reference the paper in front of you. So the better job you do at dissecting it and making sure you understand the terms, making sure you understand the concepts, the better you're gonna do on that quiz. So there are a couple different environmental factors that affect our uh, the way our enzymes are capable of functioning. One of them is temperature. Temperature increases Brownian movement. We've discussed that in lab. So what's actually happening to your enzymes when you start messing with your temperature? If the temperature is too low, you get reduced flexibility. If you think about it like ice water, when you remove the energy from the system and those um, molecules aren't moving anymore, they actually kind of lose their ability to move all together. Those bonds get much stiffer, so when we decrease our temperature, we decrease the ability for that induced fit. And then we also decrease the movement inside the solution or the cell or whatever we're looking at, so the substrate just doesn't find the enzyme as often. Um, if your temperature is far too high, you're just going to start breaking your chemical bonds. Your enzymes or proteins, they're going to go through denaturation. 
we have optimal temperatures for enzymes in humans, like it's showing you over here. Um, our optimal temperature is like around 42 degrees Celsius. The optimal temperature for other creatures is considerably higher, like prokaryotes that live in a hot spring. There's just about 72, 73. It's all an evolutionary advantage. We're going to take a look at a video so you can see what some of these hot spring creatures look like, because it's not been terribly long that we've understood their existence. There are other environmental factors that affect um, how good our enzymes are functioning. pH is one of them. Enzymes are held together by ionic bonds, which are essentially magnetic charges. So when you have increases or decrease in your um, pH, you actually alter bonds. Sorry, they should say alter on alert. You actually start altering your bonds purely because you change the strength of that magnet. Enzymes um, often need cofactors or coenzymes, so their um, their quantities in the environment can change the way that your enzyme is functioning. So if you need an, an ion to bond with your enzyme to cause your positive conformational change, we call that ion a co-activator. The enzyme needs it to work in tandem in order to activate the substrate. If that co-activator just so happens to be organic in nature, we change the name and we just call it a coenzyme. The last large environmental factor that can really affect the efficacy of your enzymes are inhibitors. So inhibitors decrease enzymatic activity. There are two main classes of inhibitors. One is called a competitive inhibitor. A competitive inhibitor binds with the active site on the enzyme, so it essentially just gets in the way and your substrate's not capable of reacting. And then there are allosteric inhibitors or non-competitive inhibitors, and they bond with a different site on the enzyme and they actually change the shape of the active site. So again, the substrate doesn't have the option to bind. Um, it's just a different mechanism. It's a different end to the same mean, or different mean to the same end, sorry. Um, when we look at all of these enzymes, it's really important because a lot of the times in our metabolism, we're looking at the sum total of all chemical interactions, and a lot of them are driven or controlled by enzymes. So we worry about anabolic reactions that are spending energy and catabolic reactions that are gaining energy for us. There are a lot of different enzyme pathways that you can choose to follow and study, but at the end of the day, they're really controlling our metabolism on um, kind of a whole whole organism scale and then on a cellular scale as well. On occasion you have some um, some bonding or some enzymes that have two open sites and what you end up with is an end product um, or you can end up with an end product that's different from your initial substrate. What I mean in that is that your enzyme might be able to react on an allosteric site or on a traditional activation site, and sometimes you might need what's in that allosteric site. So if your body chooses to release that ion instead um, to control a reaction rate or to control a situation, it can do that. It's just an increase in the potential variability of our systems. That's actually the end of chapter 6, or at least the end of what I thought was um, important for our purposes in chapter 6. Next we're going to move on to how cells harvest energy. Cells harvest energy through the acts of respiration. We look at autotrophs and heterotrophs in these next two chapters. So autotrophs um, convert radiant energy to chemical energy. So they undergo photosynthesis. It's heterotrophs, that second line that we're curious about. They live off of autotrophs. They themselves undergo respiration, or this process that we are going to study. Plants are capable of undergoing respiration, and they do it all the time, but it's more important in heterotrophs. So there are lots of dehydrogenations that are occurring in cellular respiration, and we're going to look at a majority of them, and we're actually going to look at how one of those, uh, how a carrier of a dehydrogenated system works. When we say dehydrogenations, you can break it down. So D means we're taking it away. Hydrogen is a reference, or the, this is a reference to hydrogen. Um, and this word together means that we're taking hydrogens off of things. Um, 
Our study of cellular respiration is essentially the complete oxidation of a molecule of glucose, and we're going to look at aerobic respiration, which is essentially when you oxidize glucose and the last acceptor of the last electron is oxygen, and anaerobic respiration, where the last acceptor of the last electron of glucose is essentially anything else. So let's get cracking. What you see here is one of those dehydrogenation dehydrogenation systems. So there are some enzymes that use NADH um, or NAD+. We're going to think of it as a battery. And these enzymes use this NAD+, as a cofactor. And they bind with other really energy-rich molecules. And the two electrons that are hanging off the side of this energy-rich molecule are actually added onto NAD+. NAD plus actually, um, and it, it takes one of those hydrogens that you see on this energy rich molecule as well. They give it that generic name because it can be a few different things. So what happens after those two electrons and that hydrogen molecule are transferred onto our NAD plus battery? Um, the enzyme releases both things. It releases the product with the hydrogen ion attached to it. And then it re releases our battery, but now we call it NADH. And I realize this all seems kind of vague and a little bit out of nowhere, but we're going to use these NADH batteries a lot in this chapter. And we're also going to use a battery that functions essentially the same way, but it's called FADH2. We're also going to talk about energy harvesting. We're going to try to get some of these terms down before we really get going in the lecture so the lecture doesn't seem as intimidating. So as we talk about cellular respiration, energy is harvested in two ways. Two steps will learn undergo substrate level phosphorylation, and that's just when you use an enzyme to attach inorganic phosphate to an ADP molecule. And then one of the systems we're going to study undergoes oxidative phosphorylation to harvest energy. And that's when rather than using an enzyme to attach those two things, you use a really high gradient. Again, we're going to get into the specifics, but just know that that's what substrate level phosphorylation is in comparison to oxidative. So here's our general overall system. Notice a few things. One, the first process we're learning, glycolysis, happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. It charges that battery we just talked about and it's capable of making ATP through substrate level phosphorylation. The next step we'll look at is called pyruvate oxidation and it takes place inside the mitochondria, um, inside that internal matrix actually. And it also charges some of those NAD batteries we've learned, but its output rather than ATP is actually CO2. This is where the CO2 we breathe, we breathe out, we exhale, that's where it comes from. The next step is the Krebs cycle. It again charges those two batteries we've referenced. It outputs some CO2 and it creates some ATP uh, via substrate level phosphorylation. And then the third chunk that we are going to learn is actually called oxidative phosphorylation, and it's broken down into two separate processes. The electron transport chain um, exists on the cisternal membrane, and it pumps hydrogen into the inner membrane space, and the hydrogens come back through into the inner, uh, inner mitochondrial matrix to create a whole bunch of ATP. We're going to learn a lot of specifics, but this is where we're going. So maybe um, pause the video and kind of take a look and just examine this image for a minute. So our first step, our first process is glycolysis, which literally means sugar splitting. We break glycolysis up um, into some different reactions. There are priming reactions, and in the priming reaction, we're preparing everything to happen. We add two inorganic phosphates to glucose. Glucose is a six carbon chain. One phosphate goes on the first carbon, one phosphate goes on the sixth carbon. And the whole thing kind of changes structure, so we change its name. So glucose becomes fructose 1,6-biphosphate. And again, this uh, little section on the end, it tells you that there's a phosphate on carbon 1 and a phosphate on carbon 6. That's where those numbers come from. It's an, um, an inorganic chemistry nomenclature trick. The next step in glycolysis is to take those primed uh, fructose 6 
one biphosphates and to cleave them. We break them in half and we break them in half into sh two sugars called G3Ps. The, um, the following step is oxidation and ATP formation. So we take those two G3Ps from our last step and we oxidize them or we remove their electrons and those electrons in the hydrogen atoms get added onto our uh, ADP plus battery. We add some more phosphates to the G3Ps that have just been oxidized and their name is going to change again because we've been changing their structure. So that's this big nice long name that we're going to learn over here. It's 1,3-biphosphiglycerate. 1,3-biphosphiglycerate. We'll say these slow so we can get them in our brains. Um, substrate phosphorylation starts happening at these levels because we're going to start popping those ADPs back off or those phosphoruses back off to add them to ADPs. If you've noticed, we've added two PIs up here and we added two PIs down here. So we've actually input some ATP into the system to make it work. So this is our energy input phase. But after we get to that G3P step, we're going to start making our energy. Um, so we take our 1,3-biphosphate glycerate um, molecule and we essentially rearrange it four more times. It undergoes four more reactions and at the end of those four reactions the name of what is left is pyruvate. And we have two pyruvates and they are both three carbon molecules. And substrate phosphorylation is going to occur again because as we're doing all these rearrangements, we're breaking bonds so we're releasing energy. And this system captures that energy um, it captures those phosphoruses and substrate phosphorylation happens. So here's a picture of what's going on. So we start with glucose up top and we add one, um, one phosphorus to that glucose and we start calling it glucose 6-phosphate. So the first, the first phosphorus group gets added to the 6th carbon. And then we add our next um, it undergoes a conformational change and then we're adding another phosphate and we end up with fructose 1,6 biphosphate. So that original 6 carbon molecule has just changed shape and changed where it's got some extra phosphorus groups on it. The next step in this is where we're going to cleave this fructose 6-biphosphate. So I told you earlier that we create three G3Ps. Um, it's actually not that easy. <laughs> we create one G3P and then we create one um, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, but it's just going to get turned into G3P. I just skipped that step for simplicity's sake. I realize none of this is actually simple. It takes some time to, to learn this, but fructose 1,6 biphosphate for our purposes is being changed into three G3Ps. Those G3Ps are reduced, they're acted upon by those NADH enzyme complexes. Um, we take some hydrogen, we take two electrons, and we charge two of these NADH batteries. Our molecules are now um, called GTP, or I'm sorry, BPG, uh, and again we're going to act on them with um, ADP and we're going to strip some of that phosphate that we've been adding to it and we're going to regain some of our energy. Our new molecule is called 3PG and it's going to undergo a whole bunch of reactions. We're not going to memorize all of these individual reactions. Um, as it's undergoing all these reactions, it's losing carbon and it's changing shape and it's releasing energy into the system. That energy is going to be captured by those nice enzymes and added on um, and going to be used to add phosphate back onto our ADP. So we used uh, two phosphate to start this process to kind of kick it into gear when we created the fructose 1,6 biphosphate. Um, and now we've gotten four back. And what we end up with at the end of glycolysis are two different little molecules, and those little molecules are called pyruvate. Those pyruvates um, have to be oxidized. They have to undergo decarboxylation, which is exactly as it sounds. We need to move, remove some carboxyl groups. So pyruvate is going to be acted on by NAD+. 
some CO2 is going to leave the system and we end up attaching a little enzyme to it called acetyl-CoA. And that's the end of our pyruvate oxidation step. The Krebs cycle, I that's misspelled, I apologize. This should say Krebs cycle. Um, the Krebs cycle is nine more individual reactions that are happening in seven steps. So this is what's going on. There are two units of that acetyl-CoA because we had two pyruvates from our last step. They're both going to be oxidized and we're going to end up charging six more of those batteries we've talked about that are NADHs and then we'll charge two more batteries called NADH2s. <laughs> That's the overall of what's happening in the Krebs cycle. The individual reactions that are going on, the first one is called condensation. So what condensation is, is citrate is formed by mixing those acetyl-CoA's that came in from oxidation with oxaloacetate. So when you mix acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate, you get citrate. The citrate is going to undergo isomerization. So some OH groups are going to be removed from our citrate structure and water is going to be removed as well. You have to get the OH group out of the way to be able to remove the extra hydrogen for the water. And then you're going to put that OH group right back on there. The name of the citrate is now going to change because we've changed its chemical structure by moving that OH group. So we call it isocitrate. And then the isocitrate gets to move into step number three. Step number three is your first oxidation process. So oxidative uh, decarboxylation is going to result in some CO2 leaving. So you're going to oxidate your isocitrate and you end up with some CO2 that, that leaves. You charge some NADH um, and something called an alpha ketoglutarate. And that alpha ketoglutarate is uh, just an organic molecule that will come into play later. So after we've gotten rid of more CO2 and charged more NADH, we're going to move on to our second oxidation, which is step number four. So in uh, step number four, we're actually going to utilize a really big multi-enzyme complex, and we're just going to undergo that decarboxylation again. And now um, our little molecule is going to be called succinyl-CoA. <clears throat> so here's where we just left off. We resulted in this chemical, and this chemical is going to undergo substrate level phosphorylation. So this succinyl group is going to be cleaved from that CoA enzyme, um, and an inorganic phosphate is going to be released in the process. That phosphate is initially going to get attached onto something called GTP, um, but that GTP is going to give up that phosphate right away, and we're just going to create some more ATP. The resulting molecule, that group that was cleaved from CoA, now we're going to call it succinate, and it's going to undergo a third oxidation. So again, we're going to remove some electrons, and our new molecule is called fumarate. This reaction is going to charge a battery called FAD. It's a weaker battery than NAD. It's not capable of carrying that proton, that hydrogen atom that we were looking at before. It can only get those electrons, which is why its name changes um, to FADH2, because it ends up carrying two hydrogen electrons. The last step is to actually regenerate that oxoacetate um, that we talked about in the, f the very, very first step. And that is because this process is kind of awful. <laughs> People refer to the Krebs cycle as an example of unintelligent design. Because we have to add water to that fumarate, and it becomes something called malate. And then malate, in turn, is oxidized into this oxaloacetate. And the process charges more ATP, but or I'm sorry, it charges more NAD+, plus, but you um, you don't get all of the carbons out of the system and all of the reactions out of the system that you would like because it has to rebuild itself. So you're degrading all carbon chains that could be passed on 
but that's actually not happening. Um, you end up passing on just a lot of the electron carriers. And then you keep what you need to restart your cycle. So here's what the Krebs cycle looks like uh, in an image for us visual folk. So you start up top with your acetyl-CoA and it's mixed with that oxaloacetate and it creates citrate which is a six carbon molecule. That citrate is oxidized, CO2 leaves and you have an NAD plus battery being charged. The five carbon molecule that's left is oxidized again, it undergoes the second oxidation. More CO2 leaves and uh, NADH plus leaves as well. That four carbon molecule changes shape again to release one of the phosphoruses it was holding. So it's undergoing substrate level phosphorylation in that step. And you make some ATP. It's oxidized yet again. And you charge two FADHs. I'm sorry, you charge one FADH, and then you charge NADH again in the next oxidation step. So you have um, used up all of the potential carbons that you were capable of using up, because now we've ended back um, right at this step. I'm sorry, I'm just not good at highlighting these things. It looks a little swirly. Um, so you end up back at that step with the oxaloacetate. So there are potentially more carbons that you could use, but you want to keep the cycle going. So we are just going to stick being happy with all of our batteries that have been charged throughout the course of this process and the ATP that we have made. What's important to remember with this process is that it's going to turn twice because we made two pyruvates before and we made two acetyl-CoA's. So we end up with two ATP's being made from this process, six NADH's and two FADH2's. So those are the results of the Krebs cycle. So no carbon is going to move into the next step just those batteries are going to continue on. Here this is again, if you need to walk through it, um, if you need to walk through it a second time, I'm not going to say it all over again, but seeing the chemical structure might be very helpful for certain students. Alright, so we have all of those um, nice batteries that we have charged up. Well, where are they going to go? Those fancy batteries are going to go into our last step they are going to drive that oxidative phosphorylation we discussed. And they are going to build the gradient for it through the electron transport chain. So we have a big enzyme complex called NADH dehydrogenase, and it's going to strip all of those H plus ions and the electrons from those batteries that we made in the NADH it's going to, um, the electron transport chain will take the electrons from NADH, but not in this dehydrogenase complex because it didn't take any full hydrogen ions. So this is our first big protein complex, and there's something called ubiquinone, and it's going to function in between the protein complexes. It's going to function in between the first and second pump. So far we've only met the first pump. Ubiquinone is going to carry the electrons to the next pump. The hydrogen ions are actually going just to be pushed into the inner membrane space. There's something called the BC1 complex and it's your second proton pump. It's going to continue accepting those hydrogen ions that we've collected from other molecules of NADH and taking in its electrons. So those hydrogen ions are going into the inner membrane space and its electrons are going to go onto something called cytochrome. So cytochrome is just like ubiquinone, only cytochrome works between the second and third pump. The third pump is called the cytochrome oxidase complex. There are some free, um, free electrons in the system. It's going to capture those free electrons and then pump the hydrogens that it can um, across itself into that inner membrane space. You're actually going to end up releasing some water in the system because it's not quite perfect because we're reducing oxygen as well. So here's the system. If this made no sense to you, <laughs> here it is visually. So all of our NADHs are up in this top corner. They are going to react with this first big complex 
called NADH dehydrogenase. It is going to pump the hydrogen ions across itself into the inner membrane space. The electrons are going to be captured and kept. They are going to be passed on to quinone, which is also, conveniently enough, going to take the electrons from FADH2. Those electrons are going to be passed through the BC1 complex, which is going to continue pumping hydrogen ions across this system. Those electrons are going to move down the system even more to this nice cytochrome complex, which is just continuing to pass the electrons on, moving them lower and lower in orbitals to carry their energy. The cytochrome oxidase complex is going to continue moving some hydrogens across itself, and it's going to use those electrons to create water because the oxygen that you see right here is going to accept these last free, oop, I'm sorry, is going to accept these last free electrons that we have in our system, though we don't can't quite do anything with them. So we're just going to stick them on some stick them on some oxygen. And we actually end up making some of our own water. We make about 10% of the water that we require in a given day. So here's our system again. And this part, this first box on the left, that's the electron transport chain. That's what's happening. As those electrons are being donated and they're powering pumps, and then once they get to their lowest state, they're just going to be thrown on some oxygen. And that oxygen is going to pick up two hydrogens and leave the system as water. The next step, or the right-hand box in that last image we were looking at, is chemiosmosis. So in chemiosmosis, all of those hydrogens that we just pumped across that space into the inner membrane space are going to be used kind of like a hydroelectric dam. All of the hydrogens are going to spin through this rotor-type complex and this protein physically spins and it physically moves a stalk and there's a catalytic head that is essentially going to smash an ADP into an inorganic phosphate. It sounds astoundingly simple, but it's really effective. So here's what this um, whole system looks like and an understanding of the efficacy of it. If you notice over here, it tells you that 32 ATP are actually um, made and used by this nice ATP synthase complex. I've always read different numbers. Um, scientists tend to disagree on that 32 ATP, which is because this is a really tiny system. It's very hard to understand um, exactly what you're getting out of individual mitochondria because this complex is happening a million times over in every single mitochondria. We're learning better um, to measure the energy yield of these processes. So we get 10 protons from each NADH. And we get six protons from each FADH2. Well, we've learned, or we at least think now, that to make an ATP, you need four hydrogen protons. So for every um, NADH you have, you can make 2.5 ATP and from every FADH2 you have, you can make 1.5 ATP. Of course, you can't really make half of an ATP, but that's where the, that's how it maths out. So this is where we're getting our energy yield from. So let's walk through our process again. In glucose, glucose is split into two pyruvates. There are lots of steps in between that we need to know, but as glucose is split into two pyruvates, energy is harvested and we end up creating two ATP. We also charge two NADHs and those NADHs eventually make five ATP in that last step of chemiosmosis. In pyruvate oxidation, we end up charging two NADHs again, and they account for five more phosphoruses, or five more ATPs, being made eventually in chemiosmosis. The Krebs cycle is capable of making two ATPs completely on its own. 
It also charges six NADHs, which means 15 ATPs in chemiosmosis. It also charges two FADH2s, which means three ATPs eventually in chemiosmosis. So the net yield in this system is 32 ATPs. Note, though, they point out to us that there are 30 in eukaryotic organisms. Um, that is because we seem to have a bit of a conversion problem. Essentially, energy is being lost as heat and we're just uh, eukaryotic organisms are not a perfect system. Um, in case you were curious about exactly how that ATP synthase is functioning, because it really interests some students, it has three different binding sites for the potential of creating ATP, and 12 protons causes one, per one rotation. So for every 12 hydrogen ions we've pumped into that space, the whole complex is moving in a circle, and we end up with three binding sites for ATP that are open and moved, and therefore three ATPs. The uh, regulation of aerobic respiration is considerably complex, but again, everything we study seems to be considerably complex. There are different things that activate this process and different things that inhibit this process. So if we have a whole lot of ATP, or I'm sorry, if we have a whole lot of ADP hanging out in our system, we are going to know that it's time to rev up glycolysis so we can create some more ATP. So that's usually that's our big activator for glycolysis is the presence of ADP. When we have a lot of um, other molecules in the system, we we dampen glycolysis. So if we have a whole bunch of pyruvate dehydrogenase that will um, end up dampening the process a little farther down. If we have a whole bunch of citrate, which we make in our Krebs cycle, it's going to end up inhibiting one of the processes in glycolysis. Um, if we end up with just a whole bunch of free ATP in our systems, again right here, we're going to end up inhibiting glycolysis. So a lot of things are very good at stopping glycolysis um, downstream. So there's a lot of control of this aerobic respiration. We are capable of undergoing um, oxidation without oxygen. Sounds kind of funny, but we're capable of undergoing, I guess it'd be better to say, um, respiration without oxygen. There are creatures called methanogens, and they actually use carbon dioxide uh, instead of oxygen. So they still use, instead of pure oxygen, I should say, instead of O2, they use CO2. And they reduce it to CO4. So they attach it to some free hydrogens rather than turning it into water. Where you tend to find these little creatures are places that don't have a lot of free oxygen. So um, in soils or in the lumen of creatures' bellies, so this is a reference to like cow stomachs. Uh, another creature that's capable of undergoing respiration without oxygen are sulfur bacteria. And they actually use sulfate. So they aren't even um, using the same kind of situations that we are. They're not even using the same chemical basis as we are. They're cutting out the carbon and they're using sulfur instead. We're also capable of undergoing fermentation. So in fermentation, what you're doing is you're undergoing glycolysis. If you look at this image, it's showing you glycolysis. You get two ATPs. Um, you end up with pyruvates and some CO2 leave, and you do charge those NAD plus batteries. But because you don't have any free oxygen in the system, you can't oxidize your pyruvate. It can't undergo the step that it needs to. So in the case of alcohol fermentation and yeast, you end up taking your pyruvates to an aldehyde, which is an alcohol, and then they turn into ethanol, which is an alcohol. So alcohol fermentation and yeast, that's how we make alcohol. That's how you make beer. Over here on the right, you see the lactic acid fermentation in mussels. So again, you have your glucose, and it undergoes the process of glycolysis, and it makes two pyruvate 
you charge your uh, batteries just like you did before, you create your ATP just like you did before, but what happens this time is that pyruvate is actually changed directly into something called lactate, and that's just flushed out of our muscles. So undergoing glycolysis and not continuing all the way through the end of chemoosmosis can kind of seem like a waste of that initial glucose molecule, but if you need the energy and this is all you can do, then you need the energy and this is what you get to do. The nice thing about this process is, is that all of our energy isn't coming from um, just that cellular respiration and just that sugar. We're also using our proteins and our fats. So proteins are capable of donating their amine groups uh, and those different amine groups eventually enter into glycolysis through the Krebs cycle uh, to keep that process going. So we're not just depending on sugar. <clears throat> One uh, an amino acid called alanine is going to be turned into part of a pyruvate molecule. Aspartate is going to be turned into that uh, oxoacetyl acetate. Um, and different things are going to enter into different parts of the cycle. We'll see how it breaks down in just a moment. The fatty acids also get broken down um, and they make individual acetyl groups. Acetyl groups are removed from the ends of those fatty acids and attached onto the acetyl uh, CoA. And that, of course, is what's entering into the Krebs cycle. This process of breaking down those fatty acids is called beta oxidation, and that should tell you something about exercise because this is the most efficient way for us to get rid of our fatty acids. So if we exercise at a level that it increases um, the need for glycolysis and an increase in, um, or, excuse me, an increase for a need in the Krebs cycle to follow the glycolysis, one of those intermediaries is acetyl-CoA. So we're pushing the oxidation of fat or the destruction of fat when we exercise. There are more intermediates, but first to that paper, in case you're curious, it's quite old, this concept of beta oxidation was first, um, discussed in, uh, some pretty early papers, there's a really great one written in 1997, or 1996, I'm sorry, published in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And what it's teaching us is that um, long-term training actually increases fat utilization over a period of time. So here are the images that they're showing us. And uh, it's a bit much <laughs> to look at, but if you read this figure legend on the bottom of the page, you can follow the fat oxidation that occurs um, before exercise, after five days of a regular exercise program, and then 31 days of an exercise program. And up we, um, what we end up with is uh, Increasing effects on serum-free fatty acid concentration. So we're looking at healthier bodies that are capable of handling and processing fat much quicker um, when they're appropriately exercise trained. Here's that chart that I was referring to where I told you we would come back to those intermediaries after we understood more about beta oxidation. Nucleic acids are broken down into nucleotides that go into the Krebs cycle. Proteins are broken down into amino acids that can enter into the Krebs cycle or um, ultimate metabolic <clears throat> products that can enter into um, pyruvate. Polysaccharides are our sugars or of course what run glycolysis and then lipids and fats undergo uh, beta oxidation for acetyl-CoA for greater um, destruction in the body. So we use a variety of things that we bring in. It's just this particular process of glycolysis that gets started with our single unit sugars. The evolution of metabolism is something of interest here lately. We think that it happened in these general six steps. Abiotic synthesis would have led to a local abundance of carbon for food because carbon would just be um, appearing in these original environments. So it makes sense that carbon was one of the original food sources. We're pretty sure that proteins evolved pretty early, so their enzymatic energy would have two. So the creation of these protein pumps in our nice protocells to mess with the carbon and what we are going to take off of it uh, is a logical next step. Anoxygenic photosynthesis. Um, we know that under or organisms that underwent anoxygenic photosynthesis pumped proteins out of cells or were capable of pumping proteins out of cells. Uh, using those 
proteins that they had and a local abundance of carbon food, they would have undergone chemiosmosis. Oxygen forming photosynthesis actually started using sulfur instead of free oxygen because there wasn't any, um, there wasn't a lot of water in the system, there wasn't a lot of free oxygen in the system. They would have gone from using H2S instead of H2O into a process including nitrogen fixation. So they would be pulling in even more hydrogens all the while creating oxygen and building in mass. And finally, the last step that we actually think that evolved would be cellular respiration without that HS2, but instead utilizing um, water in the acceptance of molecules. We can study this concept in a uh, protein non, or no, I'm sorry, purple non-sulfur bacteria. And we can kind of see an intermediate step between um, plants and protists and bacteria that are currently alive than what we have today in our system. So this ends our lecture. Um, I realize it was a lot of information. It's a pretty lengthy video. I'm guessing it's going to be about an hour, but you of course have the ability to stop and rewind and um, listen to the parts that are confusing to you. We'll practice this information in class, so you're going to be exposed to it um, a few times and we'll work together to grasp it.